This is to mark another significant um, success in the long history of the site here at Presswick. Spirit Aero Systems has recently secured the contract for the supply of all A320 and 321 spoilers, which was achieved with the assistance of government funding from Aerospace um, Technology Institute, from Scottish Enterprise, to support both the UK technology development and the industrialisation of this new programme. And I'm pleased to announce that that programme will be made right here in Presswick at the Spirit Presswick facility. The Spirit team has secured the success by developing an innovative composite technology and advanced manufacturing methods that, Presswick, um, that made sure the Presswick business was competitive in securing the manufacturing here in the UK. The project is unique in the fact that it will be the first industrialisation of this technology anywhere in the aerospace industry in the UK. The Spirit of Presswick business, supported by government, has laid out its long-term strategy to secure a place on our customers' next generation single L aircraft, which is due in service in the next 10 years, which is not that far away. Strategically, the securing of this spoiler project was a critical milestone important to us um, and it robustly demonstrates our ability to develop new, innovative, cost-effective technologies um, manufacturing processes that mean we can actually manufacture here in the UK and it plays a central role in the development of a key customer programme for Airbus on the next generation aircraft. This will be a step change for Presswick business which has an 80 year history of being at the forefront of the aviation industry. We already design and assemble next generation composite aircraft like the A350 that you can see around you here. Um, but we don't manufacture the components, and this will be a significant step in terms of making that leap into automated component manufacture. And the technology was developed right here in Presswick. We will also invest more than £20 million, supported by the Scottish Government, to develop the manufacturing processes, develop the skills, and establish a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility using the latest automation and robotics. We will produce over 700 aircraft a year, over 7,500 spoilers annually, and the project will create over 100 high-value jobs. The project is therefore not only seen as a first enabler for Presswick's future technology roadmap, but also significantly strengthens our ability to protect and secure additional work packages. So I'm really pleased that we'll be doing this right here in Presswick. And I'm really pleased that the First Minister is here to help us celebrate our success. So I'd like to introduce you to the First Minister now. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you to everybody at Spiro Aerosystems for welcoming me here today. And thank you to all of you for joining me as well. It's absolutely wonderful to be here at Spirit, not just because it brings me back to Ayrshire, where I was born and brought up, but more importantly, because it brings me to a company whose reputation is based on innovation and excellence. Spirit is, of course, one of the largest employers in Ayrshire and has consistently supported and developed its workforce. Indeed, I've spoken this morning to some of the apprentices who work here. I also know that the company does a lot of work in the local community, for example, by promoting science, technology, engineering and maths to local schools, and we're very grateful uh, to you for that. In other words, in so many ways, Spirit is exactly the kind of business that we want to see flourishing and growing in the years ahead. So this is an ideal venue for a speech in which I want to reflect on Scotland's economic future. This is also a very highly appropriate time to look ahead to the future we want for our economy. The Scottish Parliament is about to enter a new session. Our programme for government will be published next week. In the next year, we will set up the interim body for the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency and establish a new strategic board to coordinate and align the work of our enterprise and skills agencies. It's also 10 years now since this government came into office. And of course, one of the very early decisions we made as a government back in 2007, as part of our wide ranging plans to modernize the infrastructure of our country, many of them now realised, uh, was to move ahead with building a new bridge across the Forth. So I'm delighted to say that the new Queensferry crossing opened to traffic yesterday, providing not just a, an essential transport link, but also alongside its sister bridges, a stunning new tourist attraction as well. Now the consequences of other economic decisions have maybe been less visible, but they have still been significant. In 2007, we launched a new economic strategy, 
Amongst other things, that strategy set out key sectors of the economy where Scotland has particular opportunities and strengths. Many of these sectors, tourism, food and drink, renewable energy, have gone from strength to strength since then. Another step we took back then was to establish the Small Business Bonus Scheme. And that scheme now benefits more than 100,000 business premises across the country every single year. So I'll spend some time today taking stock, but I want to focus more on the future. I want to set out some of the steps we will take now to benefit our economy in the decade between now and 2027, and hopefully also in the years beyond. And the first thing I want to note is that partly because of the decisions we took 10 years ago, and notwithstanding the challenges we face, we face the future from a position of some strength. Despite the scale of some of the challenges we faced in the last decade, for example, the global financial crisis and the downturn in the oil and gas sector, unemployment in Scotland today is close to the lowest ever recorded rate. It's also now below the UK level of unemployment. And very encouragingly, our youth unemployment rate is now the half the level it was at a decade ago. Indeed, it is now one of the lowest anywhere in the European Union. And almost 90,000 more people are in jobs today than was the case a decade ago, with two thirds of that growth in employment being in highly skilled employment. In addition, our GDP per head is higher than the UK average outside of London, and we have now virtually closed what used to be a very significant productivity gap with the rest of the UK. In recent years, we have also consistently outperformed all parts of the UK, with the exception of London and the South East, in attracting inward investment into our country. So these figures, I think, confirm what most of us already know. Scotland has immense economic potential. Data from just last year suggested that we have the most highly qualified working age population anywhere in Europe. We have more world-class universities per head of population than any other country in the world, apart from Luxembourg. Uh, and we also have a global and growing reputation in key industries, from tourism, food and drink and engineering, to informatics, renewable energy and life sciences. So we can and we must be ambitious, even more ambitious, as we look to the future. Scotland has the natural resources, the skills and the research base to be one of the most prosperous parts of Europe. But we also need to accept that we still face some significant challenges. Our productivity levels do now match the rest of the UK's, but they remain significantly behind those of many of our partners in the EU. And the relatively slow economic growth we've seen in the last couple of years, largely caused by the downturn in the oil and gas sector, demonstrates the need to do even more to promote sustainable growth and to ensure that that growth is spread more evenly across economic sectors and across all parts of our country. And of course, more broadly, Scotland faces many of the same opportunities and challenges as other developed economies across the world, competing in a globalized marketplace, adapting to an aging population, moving rapidly to a low carbon economy, addressing low wage growth and insecure working patterns, and ensuring that society as a whole benefits from developments such as automation and the use of big data. So today I want to set out some of the government's thinking on these wider issues. Now, I won't pretend that we've got all of the answers. Nobody in the world, I think, does have all the answers. But I do want to demonstrate that we are asking at least some of the right questions and that we are determined to work with all of you, with businesses and with wider society, as we respond to those challenges. And the overwhelming point I want to make is that Scotland wants not just to embrace, but to lead the key technological and social changes of the future. And this is a fundamental point. I want Scotland to be the inventor and the producer of the innovations that will shape the future, not just a consumer of those innovations. And of course, that's partly a matter of necessity. No country can close itself off from the future, but more fundamentally, it's because most of the changes we are seeing either are now or have the potential to be hugely positive for society 
as a whole. New technology is key to the productivity improvements that can then raise living standards for all. And a more global economy expands opportunities for our exporters. A low carbon economy won't simply contribute to combating climate change, it will also make our businesses more efficient and the air that we breathe cleaner. However, we also need to manage the consequences of these changes, to be alert to the insecurities that they can create and some of the individual and local impacts that they can have. In everything we do, we need to recognise that economic policy is a means rather than an end. It is a means by which we help all of our people to lead happy, healthy and fulfilling lives. So today I'm going to talk about how we move more quickly to build an, e an economy for the future. And in doing that, I want to focus on two things in particular. I'll talk about innovation, how Scottish businesses can develop and adopt new technologies, products and processes. And I'll also talk about inclusion, about what all of this means for individuals, how we ensure that everyone is able to benefit from and contribute to economic growth. And as I said earlier, Spirit is a perfect location to talk about all of this. I've just toured the premises here and it really is quite an extraordinary place. The site here includes the original Palace of Engineering from the Glasgow Exhibition of 1938. There has been aircraft manufacturing and repair here for around 80 years now. In fact, during World War II, the workshops here repaired Spitfires. So this is a site which, in many respects, harks back to a proud tradition of Scottish engineering excellence and innovation. But much more importantly, it's a site with an exceptionally bright future ahead of it. As Scott indicated, Spirit's Presswick facility has secured a major order from Airbus to make spoilers. Uh, for the non-technical amongst you, those are the wing components you see being raised during descents and landing. And that order, of course, will lead to investment of more than £20 million in this plant and create over 100 jobs. It also marks a first, not just for this facility, but for the aerospace sector throughout the UK, since it involves the industrialisation of the manufacture of composite materials. Those are materials which are lighter and therefore more cost and energy efficient than the ones used in most current planes. Now, First and foremost, this success is due to the dedication and the expertise of all of the employees here at Spirit. It is a great example of the engineering excellence we have here in Scotland. But the public sector has also had a part to play. So it's also a demonstration of that partnership we want between government and the public sector and business. The composite technology being used in this new order has been developed and then industrialised with the help of grants from the Aerospace Technology Institute and Scottish Enterprise. I also remember uh, very clearly four years ago as then the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure having to take the decision that the Scottish Government should buy Presswick Airport to save it from imminent closure. Now we did that because we believed then and we believe now that the airport can have a commercial future. But we were also very aware at the time we took that decision of the airport's strategic value at the heart of Ayrshire's aerospace cluster. And much more recently, in June of this year, I announced the establishment of a lightweight manufacturing centre at Inshinnan in Renfrewshire. The Scottish Government is helping to fund that centre because we know that there are major economic opportunities for Scotland in manufacturing lightweight materials such as titanium and carbon fibre. And indeed, that centre will support Spirit in developing the composite materials for its wing spoilers. The lightweight manufacturing centre will benefit many other companies and sectors as well. It's potentially an asset for vehicle manufacturers, renewable energy firms, the oil and gas supply chain, and even medicine and life science companies. Now, at present, there are a host of opportunities for Scotland across the advanced manufacturing sector. And so the lightweight manufacturing centre has always been seen as the initial step in establishing a national manufacturing institute for Scotland. Uh, and I'm able to confirm today that the Scottish Government uh, will move forward to establish such an institute. Indeed, I can announce today that we will confirm both the location 
and the key partners for that institute before the end of this year, with a view to the institute being operational before the end of next year. And that's a clear demonstration of our conviction that advanced manufacturing will be central to our modern economy in the future. And it's a good tangible example of our commitment to promoting and supporting sectors where Scottish business has a clear opportunity to grow. Advanced manufacturing is one of those sectors, but there are many others as well. Next week's programme for government will see us commit additional support for the financial technology industry. We will also continue to support the energy sector. Uh, we've already committed £90 million matched by the UK government in an oil and gas technology centre. Next week, we will announce new support for work on carbon capture and storage technology, vital uh, to the future. We also know there are big opportunities in life sciences. That sector already employs 37,000 people across our country. Uh, last week, I visited Aquila Biomedical. That's a startup based over in Edinburgh's BioQuarter. It's doing amazing work to develop treatments which use the body's immune system to target cancer. The Scottish Government, therefore, is trying to support companies like that across the country. Uh, so we're encouraging more cooperation between the life sciences sector and the National Health Service. And we've established a stratified medicine innovation centre. Uh, that aims to personalise medical care more effectively by examining data on how patients with different genetic makeups respond to different treatments. And it brings together Scotland's key strengths in life sciences and data analysis, a sector where, again, Scotland has formidable and leading edge capabilities. Edinburgh University's informatics school is widely regarded and rightly regarded as one of the best of its kind anywhere, not just in the UK or Europe, but anywhere in the world. And of course, there are also huge opportunities in the low carbon sector. Uh, that sector already supports around 60,000 jobs across our country. And the International Finance Corporation has predicted that the new business opportunities created in that sector between now and 2030 could be worth 23 trillion pounds globally. Now, to put that in context, that's more than 150 times the size of Scotland's current annual economic output. So the opportunities are massive. Now, Scotland has already gained a global reputation for renewable energy. Right now, as I speak, we are currently home to the world's largest tidal array and the world's largest floating wind farm. But we have strengths in many other important areas, such as battery storage and smart grids. And that's actually quite an interesting example because they will become increasingly important right around the world as renewable energy generation increases and as demand for electric cars rises. So to go back to what I said earlier on, the opportunity globally for Scotland to be an inventor and a producer of these technologies, not just the consumer of technologies developed elsewhere. Uh, and that's one reason why we do see and put so much stress on the economic and uh, as well as the environmental benefits of, for example, making Scotland an early adopter of electric and ultra low emission vehicles. And that's something uh, we will say much more about in next week's programme for government. We will set clear and bold ambitions, uh, not just in the interests of our environment, important though that is, but also in the interests of our economy. We aim to encourage investment and innovation in technologies where we already have strengths, but also where there will be a global and growing demand in the future. Now, we also know, of course, that in the years to come, some economic opportunities will emerge that right now nobody is currently predicting. Technology moves very fast. And we also know that all sectors in Scotland include companies which are ambitious and which have good ideas for growth. So I'm not setting parameters here. I'm not constraining our future options. We will need to be flexible in responding to opportunities and in supporting companies across all sectors. But I suppose the key point I'm making today is this one. Right across Scotland, jobs are already being created in key sectors of the future. And our promise to businesses, whether you're based in Scotland or elsewhere in the world, 
is that if you invest here, we will provide a stable, supportive, business-friendly environment. We want to be the best place in the world to establish an innovative business. We also want to encourage businesses to internationalise and export. Uh, we know from evidence that companies which do that are more likely to innovate and improve their productivity. Now, it's fair to say that our exports have already increased by two-fifths since 2007. We have some fantastic companies which are already succeeding internationally. But our exporting base is still narrower, much narrower than we would like it to be. Uh, for example, and this is a statistic uh, that uh, shocked me when I first heard it, right now half of our exports come from just 70 companies across Scotland. Now that is both a challenge, but more importantly, that is an enormous opportunity for growth and expansion. So we're determined to encourage more businesses to internationalise their operations. And that's why, for example, we are doing more at a local level through the Chambers of Commerce network to encourage small and medium-sized businesses to export. We're also seeking to create a culture which is supportive of entrepreneurship. Partners such as Entrepreneurial Spark have already helped to encourage a whole new generation of entrepreneurs and business startups. But we want to do even more. Uh, and so next week, we'll also announce plans to further support graduate entrepreneurs. And we're working to unlock and encourage investment, which helps businesses to grow. That's why we launched the first stage of the Scottish Growth Scheme in June. In that first stage, Scottish Enterprise and the EU will each provide £50 million for investment in Scottish companies that are looking to expand or raise finance. And we expect that investment to be matched by private investors. So it should result in a total of £200 million of investment into Scottish businesses. And we're also looking carefully at what further steps we can take in addition to the growth scheme that will support companies in need of finance. We want to use all of the powers at our disposal to help businesses not just to start up, but to expand. And again, we'll set out more about that in the programme for government next week. And finally, we want to encourage businesses' own expenditure on research and development. That's grown fairly strongly in the last decade, but from a very low base. And it's a measure where we still lag significantly behind many of our European partners. And that really matters because research and development helps to drive innovation and therefore makes a difference to productivity and economic growth. And again, Spirit is the perfect example of that. So I can announce today that in each of the next three years, we will increase Scottish Enterprise support for this by almost 70%, from £22 million a year to £37 million. And we expect that £45 million of increased investment from the public sector over the next three years to result in almost £300 million of further research and development expenditure. And that's a further sign of our determination to work with businesses to address an issue that, if left unaddressed, is harmful to growth. Now, as I've hopefully made clear, when it makes sense to do so, the Scottish Government will invest additional funding to support innovation and help ambitious companies. But the other thing we are determined to do is make the most of the money we already spend. We already invest more than £2 billion every year on skills and business support. For enterprise and economic development specifically, we spend £100 ahead more than the UK as a whole does. I mentioned earlier that the new strategic board for the enterprise and skills agencies will come into being later this year. And one reason for establishing this board is to ensure better coordination of those agencies and to get the maximum possible impact from our spending. Now, the quality of the leadership of that board will be absolutely crucial, which is why I'm delighted today to be able to announce that the board's uh, first chair will be Nora Senior. Uh, Nora, who is here today, will be well known to many of you. Uh, she's had a hugely distinguished career in business, is currently chair of UK regions at Weber Shandwick. Uh, and Nora was also, uh, until recently, the chair of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce and president of the British Chambers of Commerce. So I think she is the ideal person to lead this new strategic board as it works with business to achieve our shared ambitions for growth. Now, everything I've said so far has been uh, unapologetically enthusiastic about embracing and leading 
technological change, about Scotland positioning itself to be the leaders of the future global economy. But I'm also acutely aware that as we do that, we must ensure that we're alert to the possible social consequences of change. I was very struck recently when reading a story told by Anand Menon, who is Professor of European Politics at King's College in London. And he was telling the story of speaking at an event in Newcastle before the EU referendum. He was trying to explain uh, what he considered to be the economic damage that would be caused if the UK left the European Union. And in doing so, he said that Brexit would harm the UK's GDP. And he got interrupted, uh, heckled, I think, by an audience member who said, that's your GDP, not ours. And the feeling revealed by that heckle, the sense among too many people in our country that economic growth doesn't benefit them and that they don't have a stake in our country's economic success should, I think, make every politician in the UK and indeed across the developed world sit up and take notice. It certainly highlights a major weakness in UK government economic policy in recent years. Too many people and too many areas have felt, have been left behind. We need to ensure that growth benefits all parts of the country and all sections of society. There are, of course, overwhelming moral arguments for that, but there are also really compelling economic ones. In fact, the OECD has estimated that between 1990 and 2010, rising income inequality in the UK reduced our economic growth per person by nine percentage points. So ensuring that growth is inclusive, that everyone benefits from it, that everyone has a fair chance to contribute to it, remains absolutely central to our economic policy and will be so uh, certainly for as long as I'm First Minister. Uh, and that's why the Living Wage, the Fair Work Convention, the Scottish Business Pledge will continue to be vital parts of our approach to economic growth. It's why we see trade unions as partners rather than opponents and why we're encouraging greater employee ownership of businesses. It's why we are determined to use our new powers over social security and employability to build a system that encourages people into work, but which respects people's dignity while we're doing so. It's also one reason why we're investing so much in affordable housing. Indeed, we're building more housing proportionately than any other part of the UK, because being able to afford a decent place to live makes a huge difference to people's health, well-being, and income levels. The issue of skills becomes hugely and increasingly important too. We already have a good record here, perhaps particularly in relation to young people. We're implementing the recommendations of Serene Wood's report into our young workforce. We're expanding the number of modern apprenticeships we make available. I mentioned earlier that our youth unemployment rate is now one of the lowest in Europe. The partnerships we're creating between government, schools, colleges and employers should help us to improve that even further. But we need to focus on gaps in provision. We know from surveys that businesses themselves are worried about digital skills and also management and leadership skills. So these have been and will continue to be priorities for additional funding, not solely for young people, but for people at all stages in their working lives. And more generally, we need to ensure that people of all ages are equipped to learn new skills or update their knowledge and expertise. And that's an issue that many countries face. It's especially important in cases uh, where, for example, technological change leads to redundancies in some sectors. And there are already good examples of good work here in Scotland. For example, projects which help people made redundant in the oil industry to find work in renewable energy. But we need to do more. And so this is an issue that I want the strategic board to consider at an early stage. And of course, just as no person should feel that they have been left behind by economic change, we also need to ensure that no area of Scotland is left behind. During the next year, we will establish the interim body for the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. We want to ensure that the specific needs of that region are properly taken into account. We have invested heavily to support city deals, and we're also encouraging regional growth deals. I know that the three Ayrshire councils have uh, put together a joint bid and are right now working closely with the Scottish Government on its details. And just yesterday, 
uh, the Scottish Government announced a £5 million investment into one of the projects that has been proposed as part of the growth deal uh, at the site of the old Diageo plant in Kilmarnock. At a very local level, we want to promote wealth building within local communities, trying to help locally owned shops and businesses by encouraging them to work with uh, and supply larger companies and organisations in the same area. And indeed, one of the issues I've uh, spoken to Spirit as we've gone around here this morning is developing the supply chain for companies like this. And of course, we'll continue to invest in skills and infrastructure in all parts of the country. Uh, this summer has seen the completion of two massive infrastructure projects in central Scotland. Uh, the new M8 was officially opened earlier this month. And as I mentioned earlier, the new Queensferry crossing opened to traffic yesterday. But we're making important investments right across the country. The Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route will open this winter. The duelling of the A9 is the largest road building project in Scotland in a generation. Uh, we're also investing in rail improvements and new train services for communities right across Scotland. And perhaps our most important investment in connectivity is our commitment to making broadband accessible in 100% of residential and business properties by the end of this parliament, the next stage of which we will procure later this year. And that's something that will be vital to the sustainability of rural and remote economies. It will be hugely beneficial to businesses, whether they're bed and breakfast or creative design companies. And it's one of the ways in which government can fulfill our part of the social contract. We can ensure that Scotland's government truly benefits all parts of the country. Now, there's one final issue that I want to address before I conclude my remarks today. Uh, by now you'll have noticed that I've hardly spoken about the thing everybody's speaking about uh, almost every day, uh, which is uh, Brexit. And that's partly because all of you already know the Scottish Government's position on this. Uh, we oppose Brexit, but if the UK Government is intent on leaving the EU, our view is that the UK should seek to remain a full member of the single market and the customs union. But the other reason I haven't mentioned Brexit heavily today is because all of the policies I'm talking about today will be implemented regardless of Brexit. We know that leaving the European Union is very likely to make business conditions more difficult and we will take account of that and we will do everything we can to mitigate that. But if anything, that fact increases rather than reduces the importance of our focus on innovation and inclusion. However, there is one area where Brexit could make action impossible rather than just very difficult, and that's in relation to Scotland's demographic challenge. In recent decades, of the 35 countries that make up the OECD, Scotland has had the fourth lowest rate of population growth. Now, we've done a bit better in recent years, and actually much of that is due to EU migration. However, the UK as a whole has had significantly higher population growth than we've had. And that really matters. Over time, that will directly affect our living standards. It will mean that fewer working age people can support the pensions and the health care of a larger retired population as our population ages. And that will have inevitable consequences for our productivity and for our public services. So for politicians, debates about immigration are often not the easiest debates to have. But making sure we can continue to attract the best skills and talent from across Europe and the world is absolutely vital to our economic success now and in the future. So it's really important that we address this debate and don't allow our economic interests to be damaged. And that's why the UK government's approach to Brexit is, in my view, so infuriating. It's abandoning something that Scotland's economy benefits hugely from, which is our membership of the single market, in order to try to restrict something else that Scotland's economy really needs, which is freedom of movement for EU workers. Now, the UK government already accepts uh, in practice the idea that different parts of the UK can adopt different immigration procedures. It allows, for example, seven cities in the north of England to use special procedures for people wanting to work in technology industries. We believe that it is appropriate, essential in fact, for Scotland to have special flexibility too. And we will de table detailed proposals on both the case for that and setting out the practicalities of how it would work later on this year. 
And in doing so, we will seek to work constructively with other political parties. After all, there is a strong cross-party consensus in the Scottish Parliament about the benefits of migration. If that consensus counts for anything with the UK Government, it must surely mean that we can come to an agreement that meets Scotland's needs and priorities. And throughout all of this, we will continue to send an important and consistent message. We welcome people from all around the world. We will encourage and enable you to build successful and happy lives here. Scotland is and will remain an innovative, inclusive and open country. Now, near the beginning of my remarks, I mentioned that this site has been used for aircraft maintenance and manufacture for around 80 years. When the original owners of the site chose a motto after World War II, uh, they took it very appropriately from Robert Burns. It said simply, the world our. And that's a motto that continues to speak to this day of our internationalism and our ambition. Scotland should aim to welcome people the world our, to visit, work, study or invest, to compete the world our in new markets and technologies and to be renowned the world our for the quality of our products and for the social benefits created by our innovations. And I believe passionately that we are well placed to do that. So my hope is that when we look back in 2027, we will see that it's decisions we take now that have helped to place us at the forefront of embracing change and addressing challenges. And the innovations developed here in Presswick and other parts of our country have helped to address the major social, environmental and technological issues that are faced by societies around the world. And by doing that, we can, as a relatively small country, contribute hugely to the wider well-being of the world. And we can create the strong economy which enables all of us to live happy, healthy and fulfilling lives. Thank you very much indeed for being here today. I'd like to thank the First Minister for her, her kind remarks, and it was a very informative um, set of remarks. There's some time for a few short questions from employees, so I think we're going to move that to that now. And I think in the audience, there should be a couple of people with microphones somewhere. Um, so if there's any questions for First Minister, please feel free. Any? Hands up. Don't be shy. Come on, somebody wants to ask a question. Is anybody down here? <laughs> hey, is there somebody? I can't see. My, my eyesight is letting me down just now. Uh -huh. Somebody needs to put their hand up and ask a question. Or Scott, you're going to have to do it, kick it off. Okay, Scott's question is, uh, I, I spoke about the partnership between government and business. What more can business do? I guess to summarise what I want to see business do in partnership and with the right support is be as ambitious as possible, uh, be thinking about how they can embrace innovation. Uh, and even if they haven't done so ever before, to think about international markets. How do you grow your business through uh, a focus on internationalisation? And to be... Uh, open to the kind of changes in, in how you do business that will increase your productivity um, and, and work with it. Uh, sometimes across uh, the world, in fact, not just in the UK and Scotland, uh, there's perceived to be a tension between business and government and public sector and also a tension between economic growth and social justice. And what we're trying to do is demonstrate that there shouldn't be those tensions because it's all part of the whole approach. Uh, we'll be more economically successful if we're more uh, socially just, and we'll be more socially just if we're more economically successful. And business and government will make much more progress if we see ourselves uh, as partners in that joint endeavour. So it's about ongoing dialogue, communication, and an openness to innovation and new ways of working. Any other questions? Oh, we've got one here. I knew you were just slow in starting. Doing the jobs for the, the 100 jobs here, I think it's going to be a lot of engineer aspects and manual labour, etc. Can you give us a breakdown on the, the basis of that, Scott, please? 
Okay, I'll, I'll let Scott deal with the, the issue of the breakdown of the jobs. I'll, I'll just say one thing, uh, which is, is what impresses me about a place like this. The world, and we're not uh, any different from that in Scotland, I think the world sees automation right now uh, and new technology as a threat, as something that's going to destroy jobs. What we've got to demonstrate is that it creates different kinds of jobs. Uh, for the ones that are in the forefront of technological change, not just different types of jobs, but more highly skilled and high value jobs. So it's about a transition and we'll benefit from that transition if we get out there in front of this technological change and make sure we're leaders in it. Scott, do you want to... Go on, okay. So Scott, the... I think we've got to think about the jobs that have actually got us here as well. There's been a lot of engineering jobs that have got us to this point, R&D jobs, significant um, front-end jobs. I mean, we've been working this project for at least 18 months, if not in terms of simple stuff before that. In terms of hard jobs, it's, it's 80 manufacturing jobs, assembly jobs, and 20 support staff, roughly, is the kind of split of that. So that's, that's what you call a facility like this. Okay. Okay. Question here. Good morning. Yeah. My name is Lakshmi Boy. Eh? Um, as you know that after Brexit, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties in aerospace, especially Airbus, because we don't know that future of uh, Airbus here. Like how UK government is going to ensure that uh, we don't have any issues in longer run, because Airbus is trying to invest again here. Like, is there any guarantee for us? Like, well, we, we need to work as hard as we can to provide the certainties that Big companies, multinational companies like Airbus that have investment here in companies like Spirit uh, need for, for the future. Uh, there's also, you know, it's, it's a, an illustration of the complexities of Brexit. Uh, you know, th those uh, who uh, run airline companies uh, still, you know, are asking questions about the future of the Open Skies Agreement. So there's lots of interconnected issues. Now, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'm telling anybody anything they don't know here today when I say I'm not the biggest fan either of Brexit or the UK government's approach to taking forward Brexit. The fact that more than a year on, we're still asking some of those basic questions uh, suggests that this has not been a process that's been taken forward uh, with the kind of uh, leadership and clarity and determination that you would, you would like. From the Scottish Government, we, we're not in control of the Brexit process, unfortunately. Uh, what we will do and continue to do is try to get as much certainty and clarity out of the UK government as we can. In those discussions, do everything we can to make sure Scotland's essential interests, economic and other interests, are taken account of and protected, um, and try to argue for common sense solutions. Um, I'm aware in the Brexit debate, there's a lot of terminology used that can be quite confusing for people. Uh, as I say, I want, if we're leaving the EU, which I wish we weren't, what's really important is to stay within the single market and the customs union because it's that single market and customs union that mean that companies that maybe manufacture components in different European countries uh, can do all of that uh, with no barriers uh, and no tariffs, no regulatory barriers. It allows companies to export and import with complete ease and to operate across different countries. If we start putting barriers in the way to that, which inevitably we will if we leave the single market, that's going to become more difficult. So I'm, uh, while deeply regretful about Brexit, I'm, I'm optimistic that common sense uh, will prevail and we'll certainly keep trying to uh, make the common sense case as often and as loudly as we can. Any final question? Yes. First, First Minister, um, this year we've seen an additional levy uh, for businesses of our size with the apprenticeship levy. What advice would you give to businesses to try and capitalise on the funding available for that? Work with us. Uh, for, for those who don't know, and again, this is, this is not a moan, it's just a statement of fact, the apprenticeship levy was not a Scottish Government uh, initiative. It was uh, an initiative introduced by the UK Government. Uh, very frustratingly for us, without any real discussion or dialogue in trying to design that, it also doesn't deliver new money for the Scottish Government. Uh, the, the revenue that comes from the apprenticeship levy to Scotland pretty much just replaces the money that was previously available through the Barnett formula for skills uh, and training. Um, 
what we've tried to do is work very closely with business about how we get best value out of that. And you know, our apprenticeship and skills programme is, is a very extensive one. So my you know, short answer to your question would be to work with us to, uh, as companies already have done, we need to respond as much as we can to what companies need in terms of skills and training. Uh, you, know, you, you know better than I do what your business needs uh, in order to, to, to make sure you develop the skills. So that ongoing dialogue is really important to us and hopefully it's an opportunity for you to shape our approach as we go forward. Okay, any, I'll probably take one more question if there is one, yes. We have a microphone back here. With more and more jobs becoming automated, manual and otherwise, what's the government stance going to be in the next 10 to 20 years in universal basic income? It's a good, good question, actually. It's an interesting, uh, and I may say uh, more about this, not specifically about that, but more about how we uh, make sure, as I was saying today, everybody benefits in, in this whole uh, transition to a more technological economy and a more low-carbon economy. And these issues become more and more important. Now, as I should say, and this is... This is one of the things I think governments have an opportunity to lead here. We have an assumption, or I think an assumption has developed, that automation means less jobs. Actually, there's lots of evidence that it doesn't. Uh, it can do if you don't do the right things, but if you do do the right things, it can mean better jobs. So that's the challenge we've got to, uh, to face up to. But we also need to, partly because it's morally important but also because it's economically important we've got to deal with inequalities in our society income inequality wealth inequalities uh, and you know that's area an area where the scottish government doesn't have unrestricted power but we do have a lot of levers we can pull and we've done a lot in terms of uh, mitigating some of the changes that have been made some of the cuts that have been made increasingly what we're trying to do is we take on some new social security powers is think about how we design a system that is not just a sticking plaster for some of these issues, but actually becomes part of lifting people out of, of these conditions. So uh, we'll be saying a lot more about our approach to that as we develop our social security plans in the months ahead. Okay, I'll hand back to, to Scott. Thank you for your questions, guys and girls. Um, firstly, um, I'd like to thank, say a few thanks for today. Um, there's been a lot of efforts went into today to get us to this milestone. So firstly, I'd like to thank our employees um, who, for helping to secure the suppliers, the, the spoilers at Presswick um, through our excellent engineering and technology development and also the future jobs. And Scott, you asked if we're going to have a lot of people involved in this project going forward and thank you for your support. I'd really like to thank Scottish Enterprise for the, the government grant to secure the manufacturing site. And I have to compliment the collaboration that we've had with Scottish Enterprise. We've really worked well as a team, and I have to say they've been hungry for us to be as successful as we've been hungry. So that's worked really, really well, and I, and I appreciate the support we've had. Also, I need to mention the, the AFRC in Glasgow for developing the new innovative NDT solutions that will be critical for the success of this project. Um, and the newly announced um, lightweight centre that and the First Minister mentioned there will be a key additional um, resource that we will also use um, for the success of this project. I'd also like to say thank you to the South Eastern Council who are always asking us what they can do and have been very supportive through a number of projects that we've been looking at in this one as well. And I also um, see my old colleagues from Ayrshire College here, so I'd like to thank Ayrshire College who have always been um, very supportive in terms of how they help us turn out the skills for the future, so I'd really like to thank them as well and also this, for the support they, they, they provide to the aerospace cluster here. Um, lastly, but not least, I'd like to thank the First Minister for coming here today, thank you very much. And I've got a small um, gift for you, um, First Minister, which um, might be a little bit heavy for you, but we'll, we'll give it a go. So for those in the audience, this is a, an A350 composite window frame um, with a picture of the A380 that's built here at Presswick. Um, just for you, I'll, I'll hold it. Right. Thank you. Thank you.